Welcome back to this intro to PostGIS. For the next few videos, we'll be using data from the Flight Radar 24 website, which has live tracking of airplanes worldwide. There's a Python library to query this data, and I'll make a video about how I pulled the data used here. I'm going to cover two ways to get data into PostGIS, one using Python with GeoPandas and the other using GDAL's ogre to ogre Before we do that, we have to make sure PostGIS and PGAdmin are both running inside of Docker. For data, I've got a laydown of airports as a point shape file and a folder of CSVs with some flight tracking data from Flight Radar 24. There's just under 4 gigabytes of data here, or maybe around 41 million rows. I initially had a little bit more data I was hoping to use here, but I lost some of it in a hard drive failure. But this should be enough for our purposes. All right, so the first way is going to be using GeoPandas. GeoPandas has a really nice built-in func function to PostGIS. Um, so the first thing we want to do is import pandas and GeoPandas and the glob library so that we can identify all of those files. So we've got uh, 160 CSVs. Um, if you're not familiar with glob, um, it's modeled after the Unix glob function, which given a pattern will identify all the files based on that pattern. So let's just grab the first file. So we can go ahead and read that in using pandas because it's a CSV. We can convert it to a geodata frame. Now, it obviously doesn't have a geometry column, but we can create one on the fly using the geopandas points from xy function. Let's give that the x column and the y column and specify the projection. Which is probably just worth taking a quick look at this. Um, so each row in each one of these CSVs is information about a single airplane, um, heading, altitude, ground speed, code, registration, destination airport, origin airport, um, as well as coordinate information, latitude and longitude. So if we're going to be putting the latitude and longitude into a geometry column, we can also just drop those out of here. That way, we're not putting extra data into PostGIS. So that'll take a second. But now we've got the same data, but now with a point column instead of a lat long column. Right, so now that we've got a geodata frame, we can just call the to PostGIS function directly. But before we do that, we do have to create a connection to PostGIS that it can use. Um, and commonly, the SQL Alchemy create engine function is used. I believe you can also use the SciCOPG2 library to create the engine. Um, sorry, I never know how to pronounce that. Um, so we call this create engine function, um, and we have to give it the PostGIS connection string. And because SQL Alchemy can connect to a large number of SQL databases, we start by saying that this is going to be Postgres. The username that it's expecting to use and the password the IP of the server, which is just localhost for now, and the port, and then the database to use internally. All right, so now we can use geodataframe.2 postgis. Give it the table name 
that we want to send this to. Give it the engine. Then there's a few more options that we can choose from. And we can specify a schema. So by default, it'll go to public. There's an if exists. So because we're doing this 160 times, if the table already exists, we don't want it to fail or overwrite. We do want it to just append. Um, and then the chunk size. So by default, pandas will try to write all of this at once. Um, so by specifying the chunk size, it'll say take n number of rows at a time and put those in. So we'll add two more arguments. Uh, if exists, and and then the chunk size. So we'll say do 10,000 rows at a time. This takes a little bit of time to run. All right, so now that that's complete, let's take a look in PG Admin. So under our Flight Radar database, under Public, under Tables, if we give that a refresh, we've now got a flights table. Um, so we can just view the first 100 rows to see what this looks like. Because we do have a projection, we can go over to the geometry column and take a look. And it will just show us where those first 100 rows are with a nice little base map behind it. And if you click on any one of them, it'll show you all the attribution. Another thing I want to call attention to is GeoPandas will automatically create a geometry index. And I believe this is just a gist. Um, but when you're doing spatial queries, this is going to make it infinitely faster. So if the way that you create a table causes it to not have an index, it's worth coming in here and just doing create an index, uh, giving it a name, giving it a type, just I believe is pretty common, at least as like a catch-all for geometry columns. Um, specify the column here um, and then save that off. The other thing I want to call attention to is if we head back to the data output, GeoPandas has told PostJS what each type of data type column is. So rather than just using a catch-all of text, it's gone through and passed that information along. Um, the only place that it really has made an error here is under the time, where it's called it a big integer, which technically it is. It is POSIX time. Um, but if we wanted to query by date, that would be unhelpful. With the two post GIS, you can specify giving it a dictionary of column name to type. I think you have to specify the SQL type. Um, or if we had converted this to a date time object in GeoPandas, that would propagate forward as well. OK, so we can go ahead and get the rest of that data in. Um, and I'm going to sort of take what we've done here and merge all these rows together and make it a loop. See if this can happen at a time, say for file in files, and a read in the CSV, convert it to a geodata frame, and then call to post.js on it. Um, and I am going to import the TQDM library so we can get a sense of how long this is going to take um, and see how far along we are. Uh, if you're not familiar, this will just give us a progress bar as we loop over this. Um, and as it reads them in and inserts them, it will um, also give us a time estimate. So because we've already read the first file, we'll start from the second file and move forward. So we've got 159 files remaining. We'll give it a second for it to start giving a time estimate. But while it does that, I want to talk briefly about the second way they get data into PostGIS, and that is using GDAL's OGR to OGR, or Ogre to Ogre, depending on your preferred pronunciation. Um, and this is a really powerful tool that will accept um, almost any type of input, whether that's a flat file or Elastic or PostGIS, um, and also accept any output. Um, it's it's pretty robust and able to get things from one place to another 
but it, as you can see, it's also got a ton of options and can be kind of confusing to use. Um, but the the documentation is pretty good, and so we're gonna use we're gonna use it to convert um, this airport's laydown into a PostGIS table. All right, so it looks like this is gonna take another hour or so, um, which considering it's going into a a local host machine is not 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 too bad. It looks like a minute per file, which is a little high. It seems like a lot of that time is converting it to a geodata frame, and then the rest is sending it to PostGIS. If you were sending this to a PostGIS on a local network that was built on top of a rate of NVMEs, you know, the write would be a bunch faster. But considering this is just a standard desktop, this is pretty good. So we'll let that go. And while that does its thing, we can talk about OGR to OGR. So um, this is actually a pretty easy thing to install as well. Um, you can use Anaconda to install GDAL. Uh, so the first thing is the command, and then we need the destination, where dash f specifies the format, the output format, and we tell it post SQL. And then we have to give it the Postgres string. So host is localhost, user is Postgres. database name and the password. Now this next argument specifies the intended geometry type. So the catch-all is geometry, but if you use point, because this is point data, um, it'll become more specific in the PostGIS table the input, which is just going to be our airports.shape, and then the table name. We can specify that using NLN, which is for new layer. Give that a go. And this is a pretty small file, but on top of that, OGR to OGR is quite, qu quite quick. So if we refresh this, we now have an airports table. our airports across the world. All right, so I'm going to let this run, and we'll come back when it's done. All right, so that just finished. Looks like it ended up taking a little under 28 seconds per file to read it in, turn it into a geodata frame, and send it off to PostGIS. Um, so if we go over, take a look at our flights, and just do a count rows, we've got uh, 41 and a half million rows in there. So that's, that's pretty good. I did want to mention another possible way to put this data into PostGIS. And that is just to put the CSVs into Postgres as they are, um, either using Ogre to Ogre or regular pandas. Um, and then after the fact, once all the data is ingested, Postgres has some functions such as a add geometry column function and a ST make point. So you can add a geometry column, and then fill it with the latitude and longitude columns. Um, I'm not sure if that would be faster. It, it might be. Um, I haven't had a chance to test it, but it occurred to me that that's another way. Um, if this ends up being too slow when you wanted to try another option. Thank you for taking the time to watch this. If you've enjoyed it, please take the time to like and subscribe, and feel free to ask any questions in the comments or give suggestions for content you'd like to see in the future.